same old socialism bad free markets good let's privatize everything oh he's being sarcastic about it now a person a commie in 2023 saying that these are common knowledge that yeah india was great etc you know these things that shows how how successful sanjeev sanyal vikram sampath jay sai deepak sitaram goel are basically their books are now today terrible for you by making fun of trashy books written by obnoxious uncles and in today's edition we are going to talk about economist part time historian and full time asshole sanjeev sanyal's book the indian renaissance india's rise after a thousand years of so basically my channel is going to get demonetized because of reacting to this video decline published in 2008 there you can see the front cover of the book featuring high praise from some obscure mallu stand up comedian by the name of shashi tharoor i know who that is for the uninitiated sanjeev sanyal is a former banker who has okay let's check out the comments he made uh, the three words he used for sanjeev sanyal versions of our dying planet slightly more bearable for you by making fun of trashy books written by obnoxious uncles and in today's edition so sanjeev sanyal is an obnoxious uncle for the uninitiated sanjeev sanyal is a former banker who has been the finance ministry's principal economic advisor since 2017 and earlier this year he was also appointed to the pm's economic advisory council so a pretty influential guy in government and business circles but he also has a pretty decent media career you know books columns invitations to conferences and panels where his opinions are much sought after so that's our guy sanjeev Now coming to the book the thing i like about it the most is that it is quite short my ebook version is just 198 pages which is surprising considering all the grounds okay so this youtuber himself is an author he has a he has an uh, ebook apparently sanjeev ka was here even more surprising actually astounding is that for such a supposedly bold intellectual project it is almost comically light on sources and citations there is no- okay why is this book so short when so much ground is being covered he is not familiar with the words concise or precise or gist okay why is this a supposedly bold and intellectual project i did, did sanjeev sanyal ever say said hey guys i'm writing a bold and and intellectual project it's what his fans have said how is that an accusation that is a bold and intellectual project kahe itna chota book mein likh diya almost comically light on sources and citations there is okay light on sources and citations okay see what he says in the very next line no proper bibliography all we have are just 10 pages of notes at the end of the book where a handful of academic sources it cite handful of academic sources short book ke liye handful of academic sources nahi rahega ki 100 page ka citation rahega how, how do you do that math what what criticism is this he is saying why why are there so few citations there's just a handful of academic so- <laughs> sources cited he is saying there are academic sources cited then he is saying the number is too low so in it within 2 seconds he forgot that it's a short book side by side with links to newspaper articles and explanatory yes links to newspaper articles which are from reputed journals reputed newspaper media houses whose comments which sanjeev sanyal has cited in his book were not fact checked and proven wrong by anyone he has he has drawn articles from from big newspaper houses and those facts are generally considered true by everyone who has ever read those newspapers okay it's not like they are controversial and he has he has drawn from some obscure hindutvadi source in some village and said that see this is this is such a right thing therefore i'm citing this he has not gotten into a citation loop as well as if people don't draw from newspaper articles or reputed newspaper sources to the comments if this isn't already making your spidey senses tingle a bit check this out exactly what ninar is saying here okay uh, he's saying that Uh, most penguin books are uh, roughly 200 to 350 pages this is just normal exactly penguin books appeal to the base of readers who don't want to go in depth and wa- but want interesting reads regardless yes this is what i was i was going to say uh, a little later anyway niner gave it a spoiler but that is my point about his criticisms okay he seems to not grasp the concept of pop history and pop economics okay pop popular psychology popular economics popular history means a layman's terms gist of the concept it's not a research paper it's not an academic paper in the first chapter of the book sanjeev takes the reader on a warp speed tour of indian history starting with the rise of the indus valley civilization and ending with india's independence from british rule in 1947 for summarizing the history of this entire period spanning almost 5000 years he cites a grand total of nine unique sources let me repeat that nine not even double digits i mean op india guess why because he's talking about one chapter he has given one chapter and he has written one chapter to describe this this portion in a in a very fast gist and then he has given nine sources 
for what the things he has mentioned in that one chapter okay it's a it's already a very short book uske beech mein ek chapter pehla chapter us usme no citation nahi hoga to kitna citation hoga because all the criticisms he makes here I don't didn't even remember that this, that this book was about that okay let me let me assure you guys people who have not read this book yet even because I continuously recommend this book to everyone this book is not about that this book is not about indian history this book is not about uh, only claiming how great india was this book is ge- in general largely mainly a criticism of uh, pre 1991 economic policies of the gov- congress government exactly how they they screwed things up on on policy levels okay because we all know, know that uh, before 1991 uh, things were bad we know, don't know the nitty gritty details this book is about that so uh, he has he has chosen a, a pretty funny portion of the book to to criticize okay the book is not about that in the first place india does better research than this dude you could have just added a bunch of emojis after every sentence and turned your manuscript into a whatsapp forward way more people would have read it for sure and i would not have suffered permanent brain damage from being exposed to the mind droppings of a grade a moron It may seem that I'm exaggerating but the simple mindedness of Sanjeev's views is striking and is on display as soon as you start reading the book let it be known remember Niner's point here okay remember this is a penguin publication it's a it's a popular history and slash popular economics book that his is a mind that at least in historical matters does not appreciate subtlety and complexity and this causes him to adopt a wildly anachronistic outlook about history now if you don't okay सटलिटी और डिटेल्ड एक्सप्लेनेशन के लिए रिसर्च पेपर्स होते हैं उनके लिए लोग वो पढ़ने के लिए लोग हिस्ट्री में एम करते हैं पीएचडी करते हैं एम करते हैं वो सटलिटी हिस्ट्री का सटलिटी जानने के लिए लोग 200 200 पेज का पेंगुइन का बुक नहीं खरीदते हैं दिस दिस सीम्स टू बी एन एस्टॉनिशिंग कॉन्सेप्ट टू दिस यूट्यूबर हु हैज नॉट गिवन हिज रियल नेम एनी वेयर ही इज अफ्रेड दैट मच know what an historical anachronism is don't worry i had to look it up too so let's ask wikipedia an anachronism is a chronological inconsistency in some arrangement especially a juxtaposition of people events objects language terms and customs from different time periods so imagine you're watching some period drama and there's a massive battle and people are doing hand to hand combat and shooting arrows and then suddenly someone rolls up in a tank that is an anachronism a very crude example i know but i hope it conveys the meaning and historical anachronisms are not necessarily a bad thing they're a common trope in science fiction or you can make a joke out of them like saying jesus christ was the first hippie or something like that but when you're trying to write about history seriously you have to be conscious of the historical specificity of modern ideas concepts and categories and not blindly impose them upon the past unfortunately that is pretty much how sanjeev writes about history let me finally give you an example in chapter 1 after establishing that india was the world's biggest economy around 1 ad he writes in a way india's place in the ancient world was similar to that which is occupied by the united states today it was not only the dominant center of economic and cultural activity but also a magnet for various groups of people who came to seek either fortune or refuge from persecution now there is okay read this sentence okay if you all can think of anything wrong said in this sentence let me know he thinks obviously this is wrong but read this sentence See what the sentence starts with. Sanjeev Sanyal writes in a way, in a way, in a way, in just one way. A means one. Okay. And this YouTuber completely ignores the in a way part and then goes ahead with the criticism. There is so much insanity in this statement that I am going to ignore most of it. Let's just agree that there was an India 2000 years ago and it was indeed the dominant center of economic and cultural activity. Okay. He says, let's just assume there was an India. Okay. This is that argument of course that uh, there was no India before 1947 okay theek hai civilization state nation state ye sab ke dimag mein ghusta nahi hai sabko pata bhi nahi hai ye sab cheeze so f- fair enough there were no nations when when Sanjeev Sanyal is is uh, talking about the the era so i guess he would say that even USA didn't exist north america didn't exist nothing existed because there were no nation states okay but what obviously Sanjeev Sanyal means when he says that India of 2000 years uh, before was Uh, was equal kind of in a in a way similar to what usa is today sanjeev sanyal means the indian landmass today including pakistan afghanistan of course that area was like usa of today in a way because of these two things these cultural activity economic activity everyone coming into india to study india giving refuge to everyone in the world all the victims of the world okay give me your hungry give me your poor etc india was the statue of liberty uh, of of those days but 
सटलिटी इस यूट्यूबर को चाहिए संदीप सनियाल से वो सटलिटी इसके खुद के बातों में इसके खुद के थिंकिंग में नहीं है हाउ डू दो कंपेरेबल टू दू एस टूडे द यूनाइटेड स्टेट रोल इज अपर पावर विच इज वॉट इंडिया वॉज इन दी एंशियंट वर्ल्ड अपेरेंटली इन टेल्स मोर देन जस्ट है लार्जेस्ट जी डी पी एवर सिंस द सेकंड वर्ल्ड वॉर दी अमेरिकन स्टेट हेज हेल्थ द रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑफ मैनेजिंग एंड मेंटेनिंग अ ग्लोबल सिस्टम दैट फेसिलिटेट्स द कॉन्स्टेंट फ्लो ऑफ कैपिटल कमोडिटीज रॉ मटीरियल एंड लेबर इन अदर वर्ड दू US is a primary caretaker of global capitalism and over the last century it has developed an extremely sophisticated apparatus which allows it to perform its role as the world's biggest superpower. This apparatus includes not just the global military intelligence surveillance network of the US but also equally important are institutions like the US Treasury, the Federal Reserve, Wall Street, the IMF and the World Bank and underlying their power and influence is the fact that the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. All of that is what makes the US the world's foremost superpower and its economic and cultural supremacy is built on that apparatus suggesting that a politico cultural entity called India fulfilled a similar role 2000 years ago is not just inaccurate but almost completely absurd and meaningless it be- okay he makes a statement he makes a criticism but then does not really explain his criticism of of the thing he criticized okay he gives a completely parallel and different explanation altogether okay he was criticizing sanjeev sanyal for saying that the indian landmass of those days in in result in effect is like usa of today sanjeev sanyal in in defense of that statement did not get into the details of exactly how usa became this uh, superpower and exactly step by step how india became that superpower because it's not a history book so what this youtuber is confusing is that he thinks that sanjeev sanyal believes that there's a similarity between how usa of today and how india of 2000 years back achieved that status but that was not the statement the statement that sanjeev sanyal made made is that what's the end result the end result was that usa today is a gigantic power superpower economic superpower or पढ़ने के लिए शादी करने के लिए हॉलिडे करने के लिए रिफ्यूज लेने के लिए सब कुछ के लिए लोग यूएसए जाते हैं और 2000 साल पहले ये सब चीज करने के लिए लोग हिंदुस्तान आते थे इंडिया आते थे भारत आते थे ओके बट ही डिड नॉट रिफ्यूट दैट पार्ट ही डिड नॉट रिफ्यूट वाई ऑन ऑन दीज पर्टिकुलर फ्रंट्स इन दैट इन अ वे वाई इज यू एस ए अनकंपेरेबल विथ इंडिया ऑफ दोज डेज ही डिड नॉट रिफ्यूट दोज थिंग्स ही गॉट इन टू हाउ डिड यू एस ए अचीव दीज थिंग्स and how that's different how the way of achieving that has been different from what bharat did 2000 years back so you see how how hilarious his his argument is betrays a shocking ignorance of what the world was like 2000 years ago and what it is like today this man is unable to distinguish between the socio economic relations that existed 2 millennia ago and one that exists under our current global capitalist system and i don't think i'm being needlessly pedantic nitpicking on one random statement to make him seem bad the whole idea that india was the us of the ancient world feeds into his narrative of that period representing the golden age of indian civilization but more on that later okay i am not appealing to authority i am not but remember he is cr- criticizing sanjeev sanyal in some ways on ex- on the exact thing sanjeev sanyal is an expert on sanjeev sanyal when he was writing this book was the global strategist for europe's largest bank deutsche bank based in singapore and he thinks sanjeev sanyal does not really understand how socio economic structures work and sanjeev sanyal has a ba in economics and an ma in economics that is important because if you have a bsc and msc in economics you are just busy with the equations and models that's not what b and ma is in economics do they understand the socio economic relevance of economics that's why thomas sowell is is so easy to understand that is why sanjeev sanyal explains economics so beautifully okay that's not something abhijit banerji will be able to do so road scholar uh, oxford global strategies of deutsche bank wo sab chhod dete hain let's just pretend sanjeev sanyal is actually a stupid person and he has written a stupid book and let's see what his criticisms are further the us comparison might be the most infuriating anachronism i could find in this book but it's definitely not the only one at one point this is important he th- he says that he is infuriated by this comparison and that uh, that that should tell you a lot about him he is pissed off that why is bharat of 2000 years ago being compared with usa of today why should 2000 years ago wala bharat be considered so great we were not great we had casteism and that is the end of it we had sati pratha that's the end of it we have we had these those two things there was nothing else in the in the entirety of this landmass which might be called india okay 
he is infuriated by that that is a very important point that is a very important expose he does of himself when talking about medicine in ancient india he just casually mentions that plastic surgery was a routine procedure and then there's this gem it is amazing that 23 centuries ago kautilya was explicitly thinking about comparative advantage and the international division of labor okay assuming this guy has actually read arthashastra which he probably hasn't because otherwise he would not be making this particular criticism we'll get into th- that a little detail very soon but sanjeev sanyal has read arthashastra he he cites arthashastra he quotes arthashastra and i have read arthashastra not not fully but those the portions that sanjeev sanyal discuss i have read i have reached at least till that part okay so there's there's no much not much debate about that but plastic surgery was a routine procedure the fact that shushutra did plastic surgery has been mentioned in countless books in in uh, ancient history in medieval history in 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 even middle eastern historical sources and it's acknowledged in actual medical colleges and universities all over the world even a hindu modernist like kushal mehra acknowledges that but he is infuriated with these particular things both of these got a nice chuckle out of me but by far the funny okay first he was infuriated and then this made him laugh the fact that sanjeev sanyal said that cortelia was explicitly thinking about comparative advantage and the international division of labor and if you all know a bit of economics you'll know these terms obviously comparative advantage means that which country can make which product best they should make that and the rest of the things should be imported and international division of labor and sanjeev sanyal while men, while making this comparison brings out the exact quote from arthashastra which exactly recommend recommends that thing when cortelia says those things that yeah do this in order to have a great economy and then he says that see isn't this comparative advantage and international division of labor and see that is so fasc- fascinating that 23 centuries ago cortelia was th- was talking about this he he when when sanjeev sanyal makes that statement he backs it up immediately with a quote it does not even have to be a citation at the end of the book he quotes that and says this but this guy chuckles at it he laughs at this the synchronism that pops up in the book is when sanjeev is talking about the rise of the mauryan empire according to tradition the mauryan empire was built by chanakya also called kautilya a professor of political economy at takshila university together with if he was not a professor of political eco- economy at takshila what was he teaching was he teaching gender studies he was an acharya he was in takshila his expertise is political economy and governance what do you think he was teaching there what what else should he be called he is just very infuriated at the fact that we are assigning modern terms to an ancient bharat which was nothing more than a casteist and and sati pratha society that's what is is ticking him off the most you see with his pupil chandragupta maurya he created the maurya empire in order to check the advance of the macedonian greeks led by alexander now I- isme factual galat kya hai i don't know about you but the moment i read the words professor of political economy i was genuinely screeching with laughter also i really really want to believe that in the first draft of the book sanjeev had written something like chanakya professor of political economy at takshila university together with ceo chandragupta maurya created the startup mauryan empire holdings llc and prevented a hostile takeover of the company by the greek hedge fund macedonia capital led by the young bisexual hotshot alexander and at this point see uh, people who follow some history channels today in 2023 know that there is actually something wrong that sanjeev sanyal said here but this guy did not know that chandragupta maurya was not in the same timeline as alexander back in 2008 that's what everyone thought and based on that sanjeev sanyal said that he was countering alexander but he was uh, he was a contemporary of seleucus nicator okay so that's what Sa- sanjeev sanyal actually said wrong <laughs> but this guy didn't ca- uh, counter him on that and his editors were probably horrified reading this and said sanjeev this is not history this sounds like the setup for an insanely homoerotic piece of fan fiction you got to tone it down man fine you can keep the professor of political economy part but the rest has to go all right so now that we've had a little bit of fun let's get serious or as serious as one can get about a book as silly as this let's probe the core thesis of the book which sanjeev lays out in its opening pages during its golden age prior to the 11th century india was a country that encouraged innovation in chain indian society celebrated its risk takers it was open to foreign trade ideas and immigrants foreign students flocked to its universities even as foreign merchants flocked to its ports yet a change in cultural attitudes by the 11th century created a fossils flocked to its okay what are the factual wrong things he has said in this statement absolutely nothing india was uh, india the landmass called india uh, the fact that it encouraged innovation and change 
uh, in terms of products and services etc that is mentioned in arthashastra only arthashastra has documented all of these and has recommended all of these further okay indian society celebrated its risk takers yes that is why the temples used to give out loans they had merchant guilds they gave out loans to merchants who took loans and went away to do business came back gave a portion of the earnings as as uh, some some interest to the to the temples uh, as gold that's how all these temples became richer and and have so much gold and therefore so many beach uh, temples are on the beaches the uh, the, the konark temple sun temple somnath temple they operated as banks so far there is absolutely nothing that that is factually wrong in this statement the fact that foreign students flock to its universities even as foreign merchants flock to its ports even the furthest left kami historian would not disagree with this who was coming to nalanda and takshila who was fahian who was human sang why were they coming here kadaram and and uh, srivijaya empire the the kings of those places they were sending donations to uh, nalanda and other kings were sending donations to vikramshila takshila all these places those kings sent even donations to te- even indian temples as well so how is this statement wrong sports yet a change in cultural attitudes by the 11th century created a fossilized society obsessed with regulating all aspects of life according to fixed rules not surprisingly this discouraged the spirit of innovation and led to a long and painful decline india fell behind not just as an economy but as a civilization now before we proceed any further for the sake of your own sanity please just ignore the utterly anachronistic use of terms like country economy foreign trade innovation etc if we have to this is a pretty funny argument he he is saying that those terms should not be applied in that era but then this is a popular book this is a popular pop economics and pop history book this is mainly a pop economics book that is why it's coming out of penguin that is why it's not coming on jstor or from root large or or an academic journal this is not an academic research paper this is not meant for academics this is meant for a general audience who likes to read books and has some curiosity about these topics that's the beginning and end of the intentions of this book how else is this book supposed to be written what is his argument exactly here to engage with this mess we have to deal with it on its own dumb terms and the best part is that even when you do so none of it makes any sense at all for example the primary metric sanjeev employs to prove his theory is angus madison's historical gdp estimates that's it. and why shouldn't he there is not even an attempt at trying to use contemporary evidence in order to reconstruct the day to day lives of people who lived thousands of years ago or to in- he is not reconstructing day to day lives of people living thousands of years ago that's not the point of the book and has anyone really debunked angus madison's work are you aware of it i've never heard of these things his no one has ever said that angus madison was was completely wrong or there's no academic consensus about the fa- about the claim that angus madison is absolutely wrong I have never heard it. Maybe he has heard it in in some CPIM party office. We inquire about their standard of living, consumption patterns, and the complex socio-economic relations that govern their lives. One would imagine that such information would be relevant to a discussion about economic and civilizational decline. But I don't think it even occurred to Sanjeev to do any of that. Instead, he relies almost exclusively on GDP estimates to make his point. GDP estimates that everyone knows don't even give a full and accurate picture of the lives of odd. Arey. ठीक है जी डी पी एस्टिमेट डोंट गिव अ फुल एंड एक्यूरेट एस्टिमेट बट कुछ एस्टिमेट तो देता है इफ इफ नॉट जी डी पी देन वॉट डोर टू डोर सर्वे वहां पे जो क्वेश्चन होगा दैट विल बी टिल्टेड अकॉर्डिंग टू हुज डूइंग द सर्वे हाउ हाउ कैन यू ट्रस्ट दो थिंग्स एनी वे इवन टूडे वी आर डूइंग सो मच ऑफ इंडिसेज विच आर एब्सोल्यूटली स्क्यूड विच सेज दैट अफगानिस्तान इज अ बेटर डेमोक्रेसी दैन इंडिया Afghanistan has a better uh, education system than India. So Angus Madison ke instead of Angus Madison, if we look into today's surveys and today's indices, even that's complete crap. So so why glorify modern indices? But more importantly, one argument has been from certain quarters that a better way to judge a society is not from GDP, but it's to judge based on the happiness index. And that I think is hugely wrong because happiness who thinks they are happy depends a lot on their humility happiness is not a blanket statement i can show you every one of you know that you can find out any poor person who will say that yes i have a happy life i have a stable job as a, as a very even whatever low paying job he does he has a wife he has kids that person will say he is happy but i challenge you to find 10 people out of out of 30 people on the streets of california white liberals 
who will say that they are happy they will say they they are unhappy they are they are living in a white supremacist oppressive structure so how how is happiness index going to help you so a more more trusted source will always be uh, something of based on hard data like gdp it's at least a little better uh, at least way better than happiness index maybe it's not perfect maybe it does not get you complete get you the complete picture but it gets you something why should we ignore it especially in 2008 when when gdp was was looked upon as as the as a god of of all indices this book is being written in 2008 should he have written about happiness index when no one was even talking about happiness indexes indices ordinary people today despite all the data and sophisticated statistical analysis we have now i'm not saying these yes we have data and statistical and sophisticated analysis today which say that afghanistan is a better democracy than india that's the level of their sophistication and uh, let's see what ninod is saying here this person does not read books to learn from them but rather assesses them on his personal knowledge as he is param gyani no or all yes of course he has read this book with an agenda these estimates are totally pointless and i'm not even going to go into the data sets and methodology used to calculate these figures because that is way above my pay grade but surely you need a little bit more than that to know about how people's lives changed over thousands of years especially if you're going to make really audacious statements about golden ages and painful declines the funniest thing is that okay if if 2000 years ago bharat did not have a golden age when was our golden age that might be a fair question but other than that if if that was not a golden age for bharat then no one ha- ever had a golden age uh, before before the last 20 years because there was no there was no hard sophisticated statistical data 100% correct before uh, la- the last 20 30 40 years okay there was no golden age before that sab golden age ab aaya hai karl marx ke book likhne ke baad that when you look at madison's gdp estimates it quickly becomes clear that the data actually raises serious questions about sanjeev's theory one of the data points he uses is contribution to global gdp between ad 1000 and 1820 he writes india's share of world gdp fell from 29% to 16% okay so far so good but india's share of global gdp according to madison was even higher at the beginning of the common era in the years zero it was 33% so by his own rationale india was hardly an ascendant economic superpower in the supposed so so far he was saying that gdp is is not an accurate uh, metric now he is saying that india was not g- growing in gdp as fast as as a as a good good economic country should grow now he is applying today's economic metrics today's american growth or today's india's uh, growth data back to 2000 years ago bharat okay he is doing the same thing that he was criticizing sanjeev sanyal for but let me let me defend here sanjeev sanyal here by saying that uh, why this is fine why india could not have had a further ascent because after all technology was 2000 years back because everything grows and is created today faster isn't it because of all the technology we have now to tab 8% 10% gdp growth rate nahi hone wala tha it was going to be a slow growth rate and that was it and besides let's not forget how much respect we had for nature you will always be handicapped in a way in terms of economics if you don't want to destroy nature that's not something america followed obviously neither did europe europe also obviously never gave a crap about the environment 5 minutes later he will criticize the western uh, capitalism model for exact those same things he will say that those prog- these progresses have been because of uh, damages done to the environment or or even to people all over the world uh, slavery etc but that's those these things were not by bharat not done by bharat therefore bharat's gdp growth rate ascent was slower not as high as usa or europe but he's criticizing the slow growth rate at the same time criticizing people who did have that fast growth rate okay it was a golden age between the years 0 and 1000 ad it was still the world's largest economy whatever the fuck that means but it was whatever the fuck okay uh, that means okay my channel my video is going to get demonetized i think so uh, it's it's not whatever the fuck fuck that means because even if we take a liberal hero shashi tharur his his viral speech in oxford was based on this exact statistic by angus madison and and way after this book by sanjeev sanyal was written so who knows if sanjeev sanyal uh, sanyal sanjeev sanyal's book inspired shashi tharoor to give that speech or not 
okay because mysteriously this book's testimonial is written by shashi tharur and then shashi tharur used these exact data points to give that viral speech okay zero and 1080 it was still the world's largest economy whatever the fuck that means but it was already ceding ground to other regions of the world furthermore madison's estimates actually show that during this supposed golden age that is zero to 1080 the indian economy did not grow at all in real terms the total gdp is shown to be exactly the same in the years zero and 1080 in his tables something that sanjeev for some reason fails to mention so apparently all the innovation and entrepreneurship of the golden age was unable to increase the gdp over the course of a millennium but then over the next 500 years the so called period of fossilization the gdp almost doubled and it's not just absolute gdp but also gdp per capita that follows a similar trend stagnation between years 0 and 1000 ad and then an increase between years 1000 and 1500 ad If GDP estimates are all we are using to judge the health of an economy and the well-being of people and I don't think that's the correct approach because things were a million times more complex than what such gross generalizations and abstractions can capture but if that's what we're doing then we can say that in purely aggregate economic terms India was in a much better shape in 1500 AD than at any other time in the preceding Okay India obviously he he's he has made a qualifications to his statement that if gdp is really what we should care about then uh, 1500 ad was a was much better spot to be but in 1500 ad there were famines and uh, atrocities going on genocide after genocides were going on which which was definitely not happening in uh, way back when that golden age is being discussed So as I said that I'm not defending the the slow growth growth rate uh, at all to chhod dete hain slow growth rate of bharat but let's remember that that slow growth rate happened for the things which were not done by people who did have a greater growth rate which is also being criticized by this guy 1500 years Of course there is no denying that around this time western europe started growing more quickly expanded its share of world There's no denying, okay. There's no denying why 1500 AD is India's GDP was was uh, more because there was something growing going on in in Europe. Uh, now see his criticisms. Well, GDP and soon surpassed both India and China in terms of GDP per capita. The reasons. Okay, now he does not add the statement whatever the fuck that means. for this relative decline or lagging behind are definitely worth looking into but i don't think it makes any sense to suggest as sanjeev does that the sole cause was quote a change in cultural attitudes not to say that cultural attitudes are unchanging of course they're constantly shifting but underneath okay his criticism is that sanjeev sanyal says that there may have been a reason behind that uh, destruction of the economy or or slowing down and fossilizing which may be social change cultural change and and control over the economy and and not celebrating your risk takers sanjeev sanyal simply makes a proposition says that yeah this might have been a reason this guy does not give a counter reason he he does not say that no no sanjeev you are wrong to say that this is the reason but instead this is the reason so he does he is like a dog chasing a car he is not going to drive or buy the car he is just chasing the car because he is pissed off with the car Neat. at the level of the structure of society both india and china were basically feudalistic societies that had existed for thousands of years with varying degrees of stability economic development centralization and commercialization and as far as feudalistic societies go where the pursuit of economic growth is not an end in itself as it is in capitalist societies india and china were doing okay their elites were doing more or less the same things that had been done in previous generations to reproduce the social relations of feudalism in that sense the anomaly was europe All also a feudalistic society but one in which strange and unprecedented things started happening around 500 years ago all of which led to the dawn of the age of european imperialism and of course the development of global what what term did he just use for colonialism strange and weird i guess all of which led to the dawn of change and unprecedented things started happening so feudalistic yeah. society but he is not going to get into the critical theory of religion relations of feudalism in that sense the anomaly was europe also a feudalistic society but one in which strange and unprecedented things started happening strange and unprecedented things like abrahamic atrocities on the pagan cultures and indigenous cultures all over the world but that's just strange and unprecedented all his harsh words are saved 
कि फॉर फॉर संजीव सन्याल कि अच्छा इतना ही गाली आता था वो सब संजीव सन्याल को दे दिया अब इसको क्या क्या बोलूँ तो दैट्स जस्ट स्ट्रेंज एंड अनप्रेसिडेंटेड और संजीव सन्याल के लिए फ़क बचा है around 500 years ago all of which led to the dawn of the age of european imperialism and of course the development of global capitalism if we are to understand the reasons behind india and china being overtaken by europe then i think the question we should be asking which sanjeev cannot even properly articulate is why did these things happen in europe and not in india or china both of which were more economically developed than the former honestly this is such an insanely complex questions that i am obviously not qualified to answer it in Yes, you are not qualified to answer that question, but you think you are qualified to say that Sanjeev Sanyal is wrong. Okay, that that's pretty funny. But let's get to the uh, to the meat of this matter. India or China, both of which were more economically developed than the former. Honestly, this is such an insanely complex question that I am obviously not qualified. Why did capitalism develop in Europe, not elsewhere? Behind this sentence, there is the the actual Marxist. Uh, I'm not saying Marxist as as simply a gali here, like I do uh, always. But here, it's an actually academic uh, comment I'm making here, that the Marxist view is that the thing we call free market economics, uh, freedom to do business, entrepreneurship, etc., risk taking, etc., that's not capitalism. Capitalism is something very specific that happened in Europe. which was based on a lot of environmental and and cultural atrocities genocides etc only that is capitalism anything else that remotely resembles capitalism is not capitalism free market is not capitalism only that is capitalism to yahan pe ek circular argument hai marxist ka their claim is that capitalism was born in europe and then this guy saying that why was capitalism born in europe and not anywhere else okay so how do we get get through this this question either you can argue that uh, no no capitalism was not born in europe markets were there everywhere okay uh, what we, what europe did for for that which can also be called mercantilism okay that mercantile the claim that mercantilism is the only way of capitalism there's nothing else only mercantile mercantilism is equal to capitalism that should not have to be the case any country or any civilization that encourages business risk taking Uh, and and uh, innovating things that is capitalism that is at least free markets according to uh, according to a general audience or 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 a layman's term only only and only marxists say that no that is not capitalism but if at all we say that what europe did only that's capitalism but india doing business with greece etc that's not capitalism then we would have to get into their genocides and why did those genocides atrocities environmental damage all those things did not happen in india there was something called the sanatan dharma ye to iske dimag mein aayega nahi so the criticism is that either capitalism was born in europe and uh, therefore why or you can say that no capitalism was everywhere we just didn't do the atrocities so had to answer it in any satisfactory way but you know what neither is sanjeev he is quick to mention that in his view the reasons for india's so called cultural backwardness cannot be attributed entirely to the establishment of islamic dynasties and kingdoms in india thanks for that sanjeev but if it wasn't the muslims that caused this cultural backwardness what was it and here things get very vague so apparently civilizational decline was caused by cultural backwardness okay okay his explanation I'll, I'll critique that later but so far what what did he say he is now criticizing sanjeev sanyal for giving a vague uh, uh, proposition he is saying that sanjeev sanyal has said that what sanjeev sanyal has said let's not get into that uh, he has said that uh, there was uh, there was a general uh, too much control of the economy etc and uh, that that was visible in everywhere sanskrit stopped evolving etc those were sanjeev sanyal's arguments but he is accusing sanjeev sanyal of being vague here right but shuru se is video mein iska kya argument tha ke why is sanjeev sanyal not making room for subtlety why is he making sweeping statements now he is accusing sanjeev sanyal of being too vague vague kyun ho raha hai sanjeev sanyal yahan pe because there is no hard evidence sanjeev sanyal is making merely a, a proposition a judgment call based on the things available around him based on the things he has read is just 
जस्ट वन प्रपोजिशन के या ये हो सकता है कारण नाउ ही सेंग वाई वाई आर यू गिविंग सच अ वेग कारण वाई आर यू नॉट गिविंग एन एब्सोल्यूट रॉक सॉलिड स्वीपिंग स्टेटमेंट बट इज फर्स्ट क्रिटिसिजम वॉज दैट दिस बुक इज फुल ऑफ स्वीपिंग स्टेटमेंट एंड नॉट सटल सटल एंड वेग थिंग्स which in turn was caused by technological naivete which was a sign of intellectual fossilization which came about due to lack of cultural openness to new ideas and that happened because all great civilizations eventually lose their vigor and go into decline acha ye jo abrahamic linear thinking hai is bande ka ye isse pata chalta hai he thinks sandeep sanyali saying that this one thing led to this thing then this thing then this thing then after that this thing happened then this thing happened that is not sanjeev sanyal's claim in the first place because sanjeev sanyal is a complexity theory guy complexity theory uh, and then chaos theory theory walon ka kehna hai ke there is no no that you linear causality that happens okay this happens then this happens then th- th- this happens that's not how the world works a lot of things happen together and everything affects one another so ye jo graph isne banaya hai ye ye diagram ye bahut hi straw man hai okay Sanjeev Sanyal does not argue this way. Sanjeev Sanyal says that all of all these things were kind of happening together and they were also affecting and and causing the causing these things to further happen as well. But it's it's not one after the other. Which to me is like a non-answer because we are back to where we started in the chain of causality. The ultimate cause of civilizational decline apparently is civilizational decline because as time passes, you know, shit happens. Sanjeev's explanation for Europe's rise is equally unsatisfactory. In his mind it was the renaissance which inculcated values like openness, innovation and risk taking that led to the rise of the middle class, secularization, mass literacy and ultimately to the growth of capitalism. Which is like okay, I can see how those things could be related, but surely it was far from the only cause, let alone the main cause. Nowhere in this pathetic book does Sanjeev dwell seriously on how closely Europe's rise and the development of capitalism was linked to the systematic genocide violence and loot perpetrated by european powers across three continents for hundreds of okay now he acknowledges the things done by europe but 5 minutes back he said that why didn't those things happen in india why wasn't india able to create capitalism and what's the mystery behind that why didn't india do these atrocities of years how much of that precious european gdp came from the exploitation of forced indigenous labor and slave labor in the silver mine okay slave labor ke uh, ya yeah, slave labor ka ya yeah, jo argument hai is isse mera ek problem hai because everyone did slavery except probably hindus uh, ev- hindus were taken as slaves in in large numbers तो ये स्लेवरी के वजह से कैपिटलिज्म हुआ है स्लेवरी के वजह से यूएसए बन गया है ये ये कम्प्लीटली गलत आर्ग्यूमेंट है टू 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 पुट इट माइल्डली बिकॉज एवरी वन डिड स्लेवरी बट एवरी वन डिड नॉट ब्रिंग इन इकोनॉमिक प्रॉस्पेरिटी और अ फ्री सोसाइटी ओके तो स्लेवरी इज गिवन टू मच क्रेडिट फॉर फॉर कैपिटलिज्म in powers across three continents for hundreds of years how much of that precious europe and before that what did he just say again that why didn't sanjeev sanyal give a more detailed and subtle answer uh, or analyze that because it's not an academic research paper this has not come out of root large publications this is not an academic journal this is a popular book from penguin for 200 pages meant to meant for a general audience who has some curiosity on, in these things but does not want a career in these things European GDP came from the exploitation of forced indigenous labor and slave labor in the silver mines of colonial Spain in Central and South America. How much GDP was generated by selling African people into slavery so they could work the Portuguese sugar plantations in Brazil or the cotton plantations of the American South? How much? Ha ha. Acha, to slavery ka jo ye itna dukh ka baat bol raha hai, Hinduo ko jo slave bana ke le gaya tha. वेस्ट इंडीज में मॉरिशस में इंडेंचर्ड सर्विट्यूड था अफ्रीका में इंडेंजर्ड सर्विट्यूड था हिंदूज का तो ऑल दीज प्लेसेज दैट हैड स्लेवरी तो वो सब जगह में कैपिटलिज्म uh, uh, क्यों नहीं हुआ सब लोग तो पहले भी स्लेव uh, ले रहे थे GDP came from flooding China with opium as the British t- you know in in Yemen any Yemeni you see you, you think that guy is from Maharashtra so many people from India and Hindus have been taken away to so many places तो वो सब जगह में कैपिटलिज्म हो गया 
period in the 18th and 19th centuries who then went to war when the Chinese tried to do something about all the drugs pouring into their country. How much GDP increase was from... So, yeah, no one else traded drugs. Rabindranath Tagore's family traded opium. All, all Parsis uh, traded opium or alcohol, I think. I don't remember exactly. So, so in sab ka bahut capitalism ho gaya. Literally stealing bread from the mouths of tens of millions of Indian people who starved to death in British India because food grain exports to Europe raised prices beyond their purchasing capacity. None of these questions are raised by Sanjeev, perhaps because Because this book is not about that mainly. This book is about 1947 to 1991's India and how those socialist policies screwed our country. And that's what is hitting him in his heart they show that the development of capitalism had much more to do with brute force and conquest than with any renaissance or enlightenment values of openness and tolerance. Okay, then why are you uh, now surprised that Bharat did not have capitalism or prosperity like Europe? Because Bharat did not de do these things. And why did they not do these things? Huh? Something, a little something called Sanatan Dharma. If you are like me and completely frustrated with Sanjeev's bullshit explanations for why and how capitalism developed in Europe and not elsewhere, I would strongly suggest reading economist Giovanni Arrighi's book, The Long 20th Century, which covers these questions in a much, much better way. One point that Arrighi makes, which I'll highlight very quickly, is that to retrospectively look back at the actions and strategies of Indian or Chinese elites and pronounce them as wrong or irrational because they did not lead to the development of capitalism, as Sanjeev suggests, makes little sense as they were guided by what he calls the territorial logic of power, according to which control over territory and population was considered the primary goal of state activity. In contrast, late medieval Europe began to witness the rise of states such as the city-state of Venice, in which a capitalist logic of power dominated and where the accumulation of capital was the most important goal of state activity. If you want to know why that happened, you have to read the book. But just to finish the point, the fact that following the capitalist logic of power helped Europe to conquer the world does not make it any more rational than states that follow the territorial logic of power. They are different logics, different ways of thinking about the world, different structures. Achha, ye, ye subtlety Baba Ji ko ab subtlety pasand nahi aara hai. Now he is defending a book which says that it was, sometimes it was just territorial power, sometimes it was just profit and there was no conversion motive etc. That's why coloni colonizers were sent off with a, with a papal bull in 1492 with a mandate to convert people. Ye sab iske dimag mein nahi hai, ye sab ye Giovanni ke dimag mein bhi nahi hai, aya hai ab tak. Okay, ab subtlety kya gadde mein? incentives and drives. And if you actually think about the consequences of following the capitalist logic of power, which only seeks endless expansion, consequences like the horrors of European imperialism, the bloodshed of two world wars, and the long-term Are bhai, ye horrors. Ye horrors sirf India ke bahar kaise ho jata hai? Ye horrors India mein nahi hua? Tab to Islamophobia ho jayega. Horrors, horrors, horrors ke upar film banao ge, tab bhi bolenge ke nahi nahi subtlety nahi hua. Ab to bada horror horror karte fir rahe ho without any subtlety destruction of the natural world, the basis of our entire existence. How rational is this logic really? Okay, now for some good news and bad news. The bad news is that we've only still discussed the first chapter of the book and that book partially. However, I do have good news. There is literally nothing else in this book that is even remotely new and original and hence there's nothing else to talk about. It's all this. Because the rest of the book <laughs> is about Congress's failed policies, nitty gritty, details, subtleties, all the depth he was seeking about India's history in one chapter of a 200 page book vaisa hi depth more or less hai baki book mein jo isko pasand nahi aaya aaya isko dil ko bhaya nahi okay same old socialism bad free markets good let's privatize everything oh he's being sarcastic about it now free market good socialism bad ye sab bolte hain ye ye ye, ye natives uh, he has that tone okay as if they are wrong things to say as if free market is really bad, as if socialism is actually better. As if, uh, yeah, 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 that's why, that's why everyone needs to go to USA. Everything, India great, India superpower, you know, that kind of nonsense we're all familiar with. Yeah, we are all familiar with that kind of nonsense. Yeah, it, it, as if that has been taught for the last 75 years. So you see, a person, a commie in 2023 saying that these are common knowledge that, yeah, India was great, etc. You know these things. That shows how how successful Sanjeev Sanyal, Vikram Sampath, Jaisai Deepak, Sitaram Goel are basically their books are now today. And I don't think there's any need to address all that again. I think we've all endured enough torture already. I actually feel like I have radiation. Yeah, yeah. Nina is making a good point. That same old. As if that, as if that's the academic consensus. As if as if everyone in the world knows that yeah, socialism is bad, free market is good. As if that is the common knowledge. That is not the common knowledge. 
that that may be common knowledge in usa but rest of the world stalin is not spoken in the same tone as as hitler mao is not hated as, as much as hitler okay che guevara is not hated as much as hitler fidel castro is not hated as much as hitler hugo chavez is not hated as much as hitler indian communists are not hated as much as hitler but they are similar and and often times exactly same in action as the nazis so what's the same old part here it's all brand new information that we had gotten from this book and definitely shashi tharoor got from this book uh, we we can suspect in poisoning from spending too much time in the nuclear wasteland that is sanjeev sanyal's brain to sum up this book is absolute garbage it reeks of the smugness and arrogance of a person who thinks they are blowing everyone's minds with facts and- as opposed to this guy himself yeah he is not not doing those things that he's accusing sanjeev sanyal of right logic but who aren't even smart enough to properly hide their intellectual dishonesty i mean at least make it a little difficult to spot that you shamelessly withheld information from your readers information that you know happens to withheld information you again that accusation that why is this such a short book to contradict your stupid theory this thing is badly written barely researched and worst of all terribly dull zero barely researched because it has so few sh- citations 200 page के बुक के लिए 200 पेज का साइटेशन क्यों नहीं था सो दे आर फॉर बेयरली रिसर्च कॉन्टेंट वुड नॉट रिकमेंड एट ऑल इफ यू सी अ कॉपी ऑफ द बुक जस्ट बर्न इट आई प्रॉमिस यू इट विल इंस्टेंटली मेक द वर्ल्ड अ मच बेटर प्लेस सो दिस इज द चैनल ब्लैक फ्लैग इंडिया एंड हियर वी हैव समथिंग इन द कवर पिक मे डे इज इन द बाद सो नाउ यू नो लेट्स सी व्हाट ही हैज रिटन हियर विद ब्लैक फ्लैग इंडिया वी आर attempting to create a space for leftist discourse in india as if india lacks a space for leftist discourse okay which is informative yet not riddled with off putting jargon okay he wants to have popular and layman's terms discussion but he hates sanjeev sanyal for doing exactly those same things yet not bogged down by self seriousness okay now he was accusing sanjeev sanyal for not writing a serious book that is fun yet not frivolous okay he did accuse sanjeev sanyal of being frivolous okay fair enough Our aim is to offer a counter narrative to the ones offered by the corporate media and the far right. Okay, so corporate media, NDTV is not corporate media maybe? Maybe that's too right wing for them as well, of course, because he's a commie and the far right. I have one question for these uh, commies who think everyone is far right. Who in their words is actually not far right but just right, non- normal right wing? I think he would say Shashi Tharoor or NDTV is right winger and we are all far right. So fair enough maybe. and which attempts to embody the values of intellectual rigor solidarity empathy compassion and justice yes that's that's the uh, things we observed in his video right now isn't it jaya jaya he mahishasura mardi